All right. Uh, great to have you here. Great to have you here. Uh, some of you, if you're relatively new to Westminster, you may not know this. If you're kind of then you, but you know or you feel that there's something a little different about this class than perhaps what we have uh, done in the past. Number one, uh, I'm actually here. Uh, so uh, typically, uh, I don't teach kind of large uh, Sunday school classes because I'm working in the new member process. And uh, so you might say, wow, Aaron's teaching a Sunday school class. Uh, and it's not June, right, when we typically shut down Sunday school and Aaron teaches Sunday school for a few weeks. Uh, so what's, all, what's, all, what's that all about? Uh, uh, the other thing that you might know is that you may have heard some rumblings, heard some descriptions that this class is going to be about like uh, current events or uh, contemporary challenges. And uh, so you may have come saying, woo I can't wait to hear what Aaron thinks about election fraud. Uh, I can't wait to hear, uh, you know, uh, about whatever, right? Whatever kind of ripped from the headlines now at Westminster Sunday School. And you realize this is not typically what Westminster does, but woohoo, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, well, um, I, I don't want to burst your bubble, but I'm going to burst your bubble. That's not quite what we're doing here, right? Uh, so let, let me just give a little history about why we're having this class. And then today, uh, I, I, I want to set up what are we talking about, and why and how? Why are we talking about this and not this, and how do we make those kinds of decisions in the life of the church? Um, so, uh, so a, a, a while back, uh, as you guys know, I was preaching through Second Peter, um, and uh, in Second Peter, Second Peter actually kind of goes off on this in very strong language against false teachers, right? Uh, strong, almost even graphic language in the way he attacks false teachers. And this is not unheard of in the Bible, right? So Paul actually will do this at various points, speaking very pointedly about false teachers who threaten and violate the church. Uh, and in fact, Paul tells Titus uh, in Titus 1 that that's one of the fundamental characteristics of an elder, that he should be able to teach sound doctrine and rebuke those who contradict it, right? Uh, now, now, for much of churches, the church's history, much of that rebuking, challenging, singling out falsehood uh, has come from th in the form of overtly theological instruction, right? Uh, so in order to reject, you know, rebuke those who tackle sound doctrine, uh, we've been talking about bad theology or bad teaching on Scripture or... Uh, but uh, so I, I just was wrestling in my own heart with this reality that as our society has become thoroughly secular, right? Uh, you know, some of, I'll just aside, some of you will know that for hundreds and hundreds of years in Western society, theology was referred to as what? Anyone know? The queen of the sciences, right? That of all intellectual inquiry and discourse, theology stood at the top. It was what informed every other discourse, right? Like we're a long, long, long way away from that, right? I mean, most people today would not even say theology belongs like in, uh, most people would say theology is not a science, right? In any way, shape, or form. And there would be many who would say it doesn't even really belong even in academic university studies other than like the historical study of religious phenomenon and what people happen to think, right? Uh, so what that means is that in a society that is increasingly secular, the, the ideas which negatively influence and corrupt the minds of Christians and lead them away from sound doctrine are often not theological on their face. They are philosophical. They may be political, right? And, and there was a growing sense in my own heart, maybe perhaps no doubt influenced by the fact that I have a child who has departed for college and now a string of children who are depart getting ready to make that departure over the next uh, number of years, that, that the challenges that they face aren't because there's some guy on a college campus, by and large, opening up a Bible and saying, here's bad teaching on Romans, right? 
For most college campuses, it's like, what's Romans? I never even heard of Romans, right? But there's, there's an assault on sound doctrine nonetheless, but it's coming to us not in expressly theological terms. And I've been kind of wrestling with some of those ideas and issues and saying, how do we in such a day prepare our people to be able to go into this secular world with its various ideas and say, I'm prepared to, to interact and defend sound doctrine from false teaching, even if that false teaching isn't really theological, at least not on its face, right? So Carlton and I have been having this conversation for, for some time now, right? How would we do that? How would we get at that, right? Uh, and so, uh, so what we have put together is a class that will, in essence, divide into three sections. Uh, we have no idea what's in section three, right? Uh, uh, it's a work in progress, right? But the, but the three sections really are, the first section is really trying to lay out a positive vision of what the church is to devote itself to as the church. What is the content, fundamental categories, and message that the church is to give itself to? And, and why is that? Where did, where did we de- how did we decide that, right? Uh, then it's to say, okay, so he, now we've got this kind of bib- sense of biblical foundation. Uh, we've got some sound biblical categories in our mind for th- some of the, Many of you, that'll be review, but maybe taking a a different look at things you've known and saying, okay, now I understand that a little better. So now I've got this biblical theological foundation, and now I'm moving out into our secular world. And so section two is really about ideas and kind of some history of ideas of kind of saying, how did we get to where we are? Right? Uh, so, for instance, just, and, I, and, and what we've kind of done is work backwards. So, for instance, if you're saying, well, w- one of the things that I really think the church has to have a framework to engage is what is commonly known as critical race theory. Right? So, so that's something we're going to talk about eventually. Right? But in order to know what critical race theory is, what people are saying, where it comes from, you, you have to have some understanding of what postmodernism is. And in order to understand what postmodernism is, you have to have some understanding of what modernism is and modernity, right? So, uh, so, so if you are like chomping at the bit to say, let's talk about election fraud. Uh, let's talk about what happened yesterday. You got to slow your roll, right? <laughs> because we're going to spend uh, a number of weeks talking about positive biblical foundations. We're going to then talk about, spend a number of weeks talking about major intellectual influences in the Western tradition. And some of that you might say, I don't care about Immanuel Kant. Uh, I spent a whole class in seminary reading nothing but Immanuel Kant, and I don't really care about Immanuel Kant, right? But, but, it is hard to understate his importance in the formation of the modern mind, right? So we're not going to make everybody read Critique of Pure Reason, but, what, but part of the challenge that Carlton and I face is how do you take heavy, weighty, intellectual ideas that cover centuries and say, let me summarize it for you, uh, in a way that uh, doesn't do like intellectual violence to what we're talking about, but also then we don't get so into the weeds that you have to be a PhD in philosophy to care, right? Because the point is, you may not care, but you have been influenced him by him whether you like it or not, or know him, or know his name, or know anything about him, right? You've been influenced in the way you think, right? So, so that's part of what we want to do in this class. Positive biblical foundations... A little kind of, hopefully not a vain effort of two pastors to try to do history of ideas. I'm a lot more confident in Carlton's ability to do that well than my own. Uh, And then being able to say, now that we've kind of set the table, let's try to dive in, serve up, and 
start chewing on some of these contemporary issues. You know, things like political movements, critical race theory, Christian nationalism, uh, thinking about perhaps some, we've already had people coming saying, what about these kinds of ethical issues? Great, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, one I'm not professionally <laughs> trained to speak to, and with, but, but we're wrestling with that. So, so section three of the class will really be getting into the nitty-gritty of particular ideas, right? But, um, but I, uh, I, I then want to take a step back and, and again try to say, but w- so why have we created the whole thing this way, right? Even when we get to issue, to issue three, we're actually not just going to be kind of having a playground scenario where we banter around what Carlton and I think about everything going on in the world, right? But rather, we're going to try to engage in engaging particular events, uh, ideas, issues, which pose a, as we see it, a particular threat to the church holding fast to sound doctrine. So this is not Aaron and Carlton commentating on everything that's going on that we find interesting. This is Aaron and Carlton laboring to try to say, what are the particular things in our secular world which pose intellectual and ultimately theological challenges to the church, even though the people proposing them don't think they're being theological at all? Does that make sense? So a little bit of kind of, where are we going? What are we doing? If if you wanted uh, to debate healthcare legislation and election fraud, then that's what the parking lot's for after church, right? Uh, It's not actually what we're going to be doing here. We might talk to some issues uh, as we talk about, you know, intellectual censorship or things like that, 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 but but it's going to come down the road and we're going to try to build up to that. So by the time we get there, we say, we've got some intellectual theological, biblical, and some philosophical tools with which to have this discussion. Because most people in our world don't have those tools, and they're just bantering like, the world as it appears to me, right? I don't think that conversation is very useful, right? Uh, As Nancy is always saying to me as I'm watching some talking head program, why do you care what any of these people think? They're just spouting stuff off the top of their head. And I'm like, oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, So... uh, (laughs) Good point, good point. Uh, so, so that's not what we're going to do, uh, and I hope you'll find it helpful. Uh, I'll say this, I think Carlton and I have found the very process of trying to think through it already helpful, and we're looking forward to uh, engagement. So, so what I want to do today as we jump in now in the next half hour is to say, what is the church supposed to talk about ever, right? What? what why do we talk about what we talk about? Not just like the week after something happened to the cap- you know, after what happened to the Capitol. Why do we, any Sunday, how do we talk about, why do we, what do we talk about? Why do we talk about that and not this? And how did we decide, right? So let's just have a very brief conversation about how our culture has conversations. Like, what is the format and, uh, in which we as a large culture have cultural conversations about what we think is important? Uh, where, where does that happen? Uh, in, in America, I would argue, I, I, I can't speak to how true this is anywhere and everywhere, but in America, since the founding of this country, we have had a passionate commitment to news. Uh, if you, I, I forget the exact numbers. If you read Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death, he talks about the historical, really remarkable historical print culture of the United States. And I forget the exact number of the number of daily newspapers that were in Philadelphia during the time of the American Revolution. It's amazing. It's like a hundred. There were like, I mean, newspapers everywhere. Everybody's reading the news. This paper, that paper, blah, 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 blah. We love the news in America. Now, again... I can't speak to how ubiquitous that uh, love is across all cultures, but without a question, we love the news. We've always loved the news, right? And when we talk about the news, what's in that? What's in a newspaper? 
which then, you know, a radio news program, a TV news program. What's, when we say, oh, the news, what, what's in that? Information. information about what? Information. information about events, right? So, so at the heart of it, news is events, right? Uh, and usually very contemporary events, right? Uh, it's, it's what happened today, right? Breaking news, right? What happened today? Uh, what else tend to, tends to be in, in some way, shape, or form also connected to the news? It's the events, and it's what? Opinions or ideas about that are triggered by events, right? Um, you know, so uh, historically in papers, uh, sometimes this line was very clear. This is the news. This is the editorial page, right? Uh, uh, that line has gotten blurred and blurred and blurred. Uh, but really, this is, this is a template for how our society talks about what's going on and what's important and has been from the beginning, right? We, we've been, in many ways, fueled by the news, what's happening right now. We've always valued that. What's happening right now is very important. And then we have people who are smart who comment on what's happening right now. Uh, and so this was true in the print era, and then what happens is people say, well, there's a lot of events going on, and people are, influ but so we started to, you know, so we develop periodicals, which focus on more opinion and commentary on particular events that are particular subjects, right? And then as we've developed more mass media, that's become programs that are focused on particular themes and issues, right? But this template is kind of how we have cultural conversations about what we think is important, right? And, you know, if you wanted to, you could say, someone said politics, right? Well, politics is kind of part of news, right? Uh, in times of crisis, we tend to think it's the most important part of news. But what's interesting historically is when things are going well, other kinds of news actually often become more important, right? So uh, if you just think about the structure of a newspaper, right? <laughs> Usually the A section is what? Yeah, international big, big news. The B section is usually more like local political news. C is like, I don't know, lifestyle, right? People are commenting about different kinds of soup. Uh, usually there's a sports section in there, right? Uh, I know when I was a kid, I read the paper every day. And I went A, B, C, D. Right? Uh, right? Uh, uh, so different kinds of news, and, but this same template. What's happened and what are the opinions about that? Right? Uh, now, so this is, I think, this is the way our culture talks. Right? So now here's the question. How does the church do this? Every week we get together. We have a communal conversation. Right? Now let me ask you this. Let, just pause that. How do we decide what's in the, what gets covered in the event category? <laughs> you, yeah, no, I mean, but, uh, I mean, editors, right? There's some group of people who are picking these events and not other events. And when they pick these events, why do they pick these events? Okay, right? I mean, let's say... Based on their opinions about what? What are they saying? Here are the top six news stories of the day. What are they saying? This is the most important stuff. And when we read the news, we tend to buy into that. This is the most important stuff of the day, right? And therefore, the, the comments are people who are commenting about the most important stuff that's going on in our world, right? Now, what, for many, many years, there's kind of been this veneer of objectivity. We picked these events because they are objectively the most important things. And we all go, yep, yep, yep. Now we, you know, probably say, it's just whatever their opinions are, whatever their agenda are, they've picked these events to run up, you know. The other reason why they picked these events is because of uh, news has always been a business, right? You don't have a newspaper if you don't sell. So you decide, what do people want to hear, right? So what do we think are important, 
and what do people want to hear, right? So when you watch the nightly news and the last story is about a lady and her puppy, no one in the editorial room is actually claiming this is the most important thing that happens in Atlanta today. But why is the story about the puppy included in the 30-hour news broadcast? Human interest, right? Because people don't really care about politics at the end of the day. They care about puppies, right? So there's always been this interplay in communal conversations about the news between what we believe is important and irrespective of what we believe is important, what we actually think people want to talk about or hear, which will make them buy a paper. Does that make sense? Okay. Now we come over here to the church. And this is happening every day in our culture. It's been happening every day for 300 years. There has been a means of news production related to what we say are the most important events and what we think people want to hear. And now... In the middle of that, every week the church gets together and the church gathers and we have public verbal conversations. So what is a, a subtle temptation for any church regarding sermons and Sunday school classes? Uh, it, it is to say, this is a template that has, is, everybody buys into. We all read the news, so we all are invariably saying this is the most important stuff. So what the church should do is have its content also be influenced by events, right, and opinions. This is, but what we do is we just have, you know, I mean, who needs MSNBC when you have Carlton and Aaron, right? right? We just get smart Christian people to give their Christian opinions about events, right? Um, and of course, we also have to take into account if nobody shows up, we got issues, right? So we also are always kind of going, you know? So in some churches, man, whew, everything's political. I remember Nancy and I went to a church and uh, we were, you know, exploring Graduate studies in Princeton. We went to a church in Princeton, downtown Princeton. And we walked in. We sat down. We were like, oh, this is nice. The whole service was about economics and the elimination of homelessness. If there was a scripture read, it was some vague reference to the poor. But it was, there was no effort to expound it. It was just, I mean, what was going on there? We got events, issues, and opinions. We just have Christian commentary on it. Right? And you say, and I think this is something that the progressive church is often very guilty of, but by no means do they have a corner on the market, right? That more and more conservative Bible-believing churches are, hey, this is what we're all about because we've, we've bought into this. This is the most important stuff, and we want to talk about what is most important. For some people, that is pol political. In times of crisis, politics obviously raises, rises up, Right? In election seasons, right, you've probably all seen churches that actually host political figures to speak in their pulpits on Sunday morning, right? Who, you know, uh, I know someone who started coming to this church who went to a prominent, we'll just say more progressive church, and they started coming here because they sent their daughter to a preschool in which she started to memorize Bible verses. And in short order, even though they had been at this church for decades, in like a couple of months, their preschool daughter knew more scripture than they did. And they started to realize, oh, that's because in our church, we never open the Bible. We never talk about the Bible. We just engage in this, a Christian version of this. Christian, right? Um, now, you probably have noticed at Westminster, we don't really do this, right? Uh, I remember after the 2016 election, someone came up to me and said, so are you happy or not, right? Because the only thing you've actually said over the last couple of months is don't put your trust in princes, right? Uh, now that could lead you to believe if you really buy into the fact that this is the most important cultural conversation, church is irrelevant. I mean, pastors have their head in the sand and they just refuse to acknowledge what's really important. I mean, we're talking about election fraud. 
who cares about the Jebusites? Right? I mean, our country's coming undone, and you're talking about the Babylonian exile. What on earth? Right? Uh, so this creates some dissonance, right? Some churches you see embrace this model whole, kind of out, whole cloth, and then others don't do it at all. And then you think, well, and sometimes you might say to yourself, you might find yourself going, okay, I go to Westminster, but man, we, we never really talk about politics, not very much. How do we... So why is that? And you might, you might draw lots of conclusions. Messner's kind of a chicken, and he doesn't want to touch any political thing with a 10-foot pole, right? Republicans buy sneakers too. So, you know, it's a Michael Jordan reference to the, uh, if you didn't get it. It's because you are just been spending too much time talking about the Babylonian exile. Uh, uh, yeah, hey. Republicans and Democrats, they all go to church. They all put money in the offering plate, so don't get anybody mad. Maybe that's Messner's strategy, right? Um, or to say some churches aren't very political because they've determined people don't really care about politics. You know what people care about? They read the lifestyle section of the paper, right? So we sit down and say, what do people want to hear? What do people want to talk about? People want to talk about therapeutic ways to a better life, right? That's why, you know, more people read People magazine than Time magazine. So let's go that direction, right? But they're driven by uh, this kind of what is most important is what people want to talk about, right? And you say, Aaron, come on. You've got to know nobody in the country woke up this morning wondering how the Babylonian exile applies to their life. Nobody did that, right? How, let's take a poll. How many of you woke up this morning and the, you thought, you know what? I can't wait to get to church this morning because I must know. It's burning in my bosom. I must know how the Babylonian exile applies to my life. Right? So then you say to yourself, I mean, Aaron must be crazy to, to preach on that. Right? Who cares? Right? So in our last 15 minutes, right, so, so I'll at least say this, how does this church, right, because we've already determined not all churches agree on this, how does this church decide what we should talk about? And why did we decide that and how did we come to that determination, right? Um, so here's our, our core conviction, is that uh, we don't actually know in and of ourselves what is actually most important to us, right? We, you know, people are uh, often make reasonable decisions about what seems most important, but can't we all look around the world and say, uh, people obviously often have no idea what's actually most important. People actually seem to have, in all kinds of ways, mistaken priorities, right? Uh, and, uh, w and, and we would just say, actually, for theological reasons, that's actually true. We don't actually know what is best for us, right? Uh, but we actually believe there is someone who does, right? Uh, and we believe that that someone is God, Right? And his, his particular expertise, re, as it relates to us, comes from a couple uh, truths about who he is, right? Uh, the, the Bible, and we're going to get to this. The Bible actually says that, that God is actually uh, all-knowing, right? He, he knows everything, right? He knows everything. And that's not just a, he's not just a data guy. He knows hearts. He knows the intentions, right? He knows needs. And this is actually rooted not only in his all-knowingness, but it's also rooted in a particular action of his, which is that he actually made us, right? I mean, who knows the, the intricacies of a thing, whatever that thing is, better than the person who conceived of it and created it, right? Right? And part of God's all-knowingness is that he knows himself, and then he's actually created us in our image, right? 
So man, if this is true, it would be super helpful if God would actually tell us what is most important, then we could spend our time not just debating. I mean, great, Arnie thinks this is most important. Carlton thinks this is most important. Bill thinks this is most important. Well, that's fruitful. But if God actually were to show up and say, hey, guys, you can stop arguing right now because I'm going to tell you what is most important for all of you. You say, well, that would be super helpful. If only. Part of what we believe as... uh, Protestant, Bible-believing Christians, is that God has done this, that God has actually revealed His heart, His knowledge, His insights, His purposes for humanity. He has actually revealed that to us. And where do we find that, brothers and sisters? In His Word. Right? In His Word. Now, um... We're not going to spend a lot of time in this class debating that statement. If you want to debate that statement, that's what the rest of the week is for, and I meet with people all day, right? Uh, But this class is going to be built on that premise, right? That God is, in fact, all-knowing. He is the creator of all that is with infinite, flawless, perfect knowledge, right? Because as we know, He's not only all-knowing, but He's also holy and pure, And he has revealed his will to us in his word so that we actually hold in our hands that which is most important for the human race. In every time and every culture, we have what is most important. Now, I am now going to summarize this revealed word in... uh, 11 minutes. And uh, we're going to come back to this next week, right? So I'm going to talk next week in which we continue to unpack this. Uh, So there are various ways in which we could talk about this word, right? Uh, One way that the Apostle Paul uses is he, he talks about the whole counsel of God, right? And so let me just say, this is what we believe as a church we have to give ourselves to as the matter of first importance. This is what shapes our conversations in worship and instruction as the church. Our time is limited, right? We get to be together one or two and then maybe midweek, maybe two or three hours a week. So we say as a church, we want to devote the overwhelming majority of our time together engaged in instruction on the whole counsel of God, which is, we believe, the Scripture's Old and New Testament. Right? Um, so, so you'll say, well, you know, people always come to me and say, hey, Aaron, how do you decide what to preach on? Right? And uh, my preaching is driven by this consideration. How can I preach to the people of God, to the best of my abilities, the whole counsel of God? You could say, well, preach the whole Bible. Well, that takes time, right? So what you'll see is, as you, if, maybe you've never thought about this, but if you take a step back, you go, hey, there's actually some logic to what Aaron's doing, right? Aaron picks a series, and he tends to, there's kind of thematic content to that series, and then the next series, he often moves into a different portion of Scripture. He often goes back and forth between Old Testament and New Testament, epistle, gospel, narrative, prophetic work, right? Um, and in which the, the, both the genres of Scripture are being balanced and the thematic emphases of Scripture. So if a particular passage has a, a particular kind of emphasis, we preach Hosea on judgment and destruction, and there's a pastoral wisdom to say, we're probably not going to finish that and then do Jeremiah. And then Ezekiel, because I am pretty convinced that at the end of that, it would just be me and Carlton, right? Uh, It might just be me, right? It might just be me. And I'd be calling Nancy saying, hey, can you come pick me up, right? I think I'm done now, Uh, right? So there's, there's wisdom there. And part of that is not just, it's that all of the Bible isn't actually prophetic denunciation of sin. So we want to interplay and have balance. But if we never preach the prophets, we have a problem because it plays an important role in this whole counsel of God, right? 
So, so, and then when you say to yourself, what do we tend to teach in Sunday school? What are most of our Sunday school classes about here? When we're not talking about election fraud. They're mostly about the Bible, right? Books of the Bible, studies of the Bible, uh, themes that are found within the Bible, right? What is, what are our children devoting themselves to in Sunday school overwhelmingly? If you don't have any, you know, those of you who have children, help me out here. Bible, they're <laughs> learning the Bible, you know, starting with kids who are old enough to hear, <laughs> right? Well, and old enough to, well, I will say this, I don't think we do a lot of instruction in the nursery. Uh, kids who are old enough to like sit and go, right? So we're not like, I don't think Sue Jakes, I haven't been down there. I don't think she's like got a baby in the cradle going, right? In the beginning, what's the word, right? <laughs> So I think we do have some wisdom in saying they have to be able to like sit and, I don't know, maybe do a craft or something. Uh, but, but people are amazed, like, because they go down there and like, wow, look at all the Bible you're teaching four-year-olds, right? Why is that? Because we think this is it, and compared to this, there's nothing else, right? There's nothing else. Now, we know this Bible doesn't actually say everything about everything. We know that. And actually, the Bible knows that. The Bible actually is very clear about uh, some of its own limits. It doesn't say, uh, you know, Acts 30 is actually about organic chemistry, right? No, no. It, it says, hey, there are secret things that belong to the Lord. And as we'll get into, there are things that, in which Christians actually have freedom. And God kind of says, go figure it out. But as Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children so that we may obey all the words of this law. So part of what we believe about this whole counsel is that while it is not exhaustive, it is utterly sufficient, utterly sufficient, right? So one of the big arguments against the kind of teaching we have here at Westminster is you never talk about stuff that's super important. You're always talking about the Bible right? You're, I mean, the Bible's okay, but doggone it, what about election fraud? You know? So our conviction is the Bible is sufficient, right? Now, um, I do have to preach at 11, so I, we may just have an abrupt end. I'm just going to tell you. At 11.45, I mean, what? At a, the abrupt end is in 11.45, so buckle in. Here comes the critique of pure reason. Uh, no, six minutes max. And then if, if I have to stop in the middle of a sentence, we pick up exactly there next week, okay? Uh, and I'm scheduled to teach next week, so I'm not cutting into Carlton's time. Uh, which, let me just tell you, you don't want me to do that. Uh, and he says, right. That was kind of like tongue-in-cheek, right? You don't want, you know. Uh, uh, and just so you know, Arnie's like in like a Thursday Bible study I teach every week. So he's like, yeah, we know. Uh, get Carlton up there. Uh, so, uh, so this sufficient word. And, um, and so, so it's not exhaustive, but it's sufficient. And, and yet, I've already said to you, hey, we're, we're going to be spending some time in this class, which is a little atypical, talking about uh, Immanuel Kant or Rousseau or postmodernism or critical race theory. <laughs> what, what, what's that? Well, Again, sometimes there are events and ideas and issues that rise to a level of prominence which say this is coming, pressing in such a way that if we are not aware of how to deal with it, it will actually begin to erode our belief in convictions about, uh, uh, about the Bible and about the whole counsel of God. And perhaps we should do more of that, right? Carlton and I have been talking. I think as the culture becomes more aggressive and hostile against Christianity, there may actually be a larger place that's necessary for kind of ap apologetic equipping in this church, right? Uh, so that, you know, kids go to college and they're, they get hammered with stuff and they're like, right, we talked about this right? Maybe we need to be doing more of that and not just saying critical race theory and you say, well, I'd like to talk about justification by faith, right? Nobody cares about that. And eventually you come back and say, I'm not sure I believe in justification by faith anymore. Why? Were they undermining it? 
No, they were talking about very, very different stuff, but somehow I just don't have these convictions anymore, right? That's, what, that's a little bit of our concern, and so that's part of the place that we have here, is preparing our people, A, to withstand that onslaught, and preparing our people to apologetically engage that, right? Um, so I, I just want to close with this. Uh, I'm not actually going to summarize the Bible. Uh, I'm going to leave that for next week. But um, I just want to share a little close with a little bit of what God has been putting on my heart uh, over the last, you know, couple months. I think in perhaps a little more acute way, just being home with COVID and uh, is this, is that I, I've actually feel like I've spent a fair amount of the last year with longing in my heart, but that that longing has been um, kind of a, a nostalgic longing. I've been longing to get us back to where we were, right? I can't wait till all of this is over and we can go back to normal, right? I mean, I, I, I mean I've, if I've said that once, I've said it a hundred times, right? And I started to feel this conviction that that kind of nostalgic, backward-looking longing is actually not biblical, right? And so then, uh, when it seems like politics are, oh no, this is, then I have this longing for some nostalgic day when things were better, right? But, but I don't know if we're going back to that, so now that just leads me to despair and frustration and bitterness, right? And instead, I feel like the Lord's been laying on my heart to say, the vision for the church, according to the Word, is actually always forward-looking, right? We look back in order to remember what God has done. That's an important part of Scripture. But so that, not we can say, boy, I wish we could go back to the Babylonian exile, but rather to say, the knowledge of that prepares us and fuels us to press forward. To press forward, right? And I think that there's been a little part of me that's like, man, the world's falling apart. I wish we could get back to a time when it wasn't, right? Uh, I, I wish I could just live in a world where I could teach about justification by faith and everyone would say, that's awesome, right? Uh, we could have a high school Sunday school class and we wouldn't have to talk about critical race theory. I mean, I just want to say, I hate reading that stuff. hate it. I don't want to talk about that. I, I'd rather talk about sanctification and regeneration and, you know, redemptive historical movements in the Old Testament, right? So why would, because there's a part of me that doesn't, that doesn't feel like we can just say, ah, the world is crazy, Let's go back to an idyllic time, back to a Puritan-oriented time, back, but rather to say, we have the sufficient Word of God, and let's equip our people to go into the world and press forward with the gospel and see people saved and gathered and discipled in a crazy world. If the world falls apart, if the United States actually ceases to be, the church says, okay, we press on right? With our eyes on the eternal prize and the salvation of the nations and the glory of God. We have a mission that can't fail. It can't lose. And so part of this is to say, Carlton and I have been using this language, how do we press forward? If the culture says, here, then we're going to say, all right, we're ready for that conversation, right? So that's part of what this is about, right? It's equipping our people with a knowledge of the word and, the, and, and equipping us to apologetically take that world to the world. But in order to do that, we think there's some wisdom to saying, understanding the thinking that has shaped this world, the issues that we face in this world, right? And so that's kind of where we're going, right? So again, next couple weeks, positive, overarching teaching on what does the Bible teach? What are the foundations? What are the key ideas and principles? that as we summarize the whole of biblical teaching, we say this is the positive vision we have to go forward with. Then we'll have a season of saying, what are the ideas and issues that have faced our world, which at a high kind of abstract level set the foundation for undermining the Bible. And now how are those ideas and issues showing up in particular nitty gritty things that are undermining the Bible? And the whole point is not to just have fun conversations about what we believe, but teaching the Bible and equipping us to be a biblical people that are pressing forward into this world. Okay? That's where we're going. Let me close this in prayer. Before I close this in prayer, let me also say the schedule is tight. 
I would love to stick around and talk with you, but you will not get that impression by the way I out of the room, right? So if anything we talk about over the course of this class, and you're like, got to talk more about that, sir, uh, contact the church, set up an appointment, would love to get together with you and chat about it, but not immediately after this. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that over the course of these days, whatever they may ultimately hold, that you would ground us more firmly in the conviction that your word, the Bible, is your word, that it is sufficient, that it is the most important message that we can behold, believe, articulate, um, and we pray that you would ground us in that, that if we know nothing else in the world, we would know the word. And yet, Lord, we also pray that you would enable us to be increasingly wise and discerning about the world, uh, that in to the degree that you're calling us, we would have knowledge of ideas and consequences that are in our world and be able to engage that, both in a defensive posture of protecting the church and in a, in a, a forward-pressing posture of engaging that world with the word of the gospel. I pray you'd use this class to that end. I pray, I pray you'd use the sermon that has been preached and will be preached in the sermon this evening to that end. Um, and I pray you would make us a church that is pressing forward um, to the great prize of communion with you through faith in Christ Jesus in which we will have eternal joy. The nations will be saved um, and Jesus will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords over all forever. Help us to Look forward to that day, long for that day more than we long for a nostalgic moment in history and to lean into it and press forward with that goal in mind. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.